All right, welcome back to the No Morning Show. It's just about seven minutes after the hour of a seven o'clock, and we do have Dr. Marilyn at on with us, no stranger to the No Morning Show. Dr. Atz, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Pleasure to be here again. Yes, thank you so much. So, Dr. Atz, we are now in a state of emergency, which means that, you know, more of us are home, more of us, less of us are considered essential, you know, to kind of keep the economy going. For those of us who are out, the question is, are we able to keep the economy going? The essential services that are operating, is that, are we sufficient to, 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 to balance the books and to keep the numbers game going? Natalie, that is a, a complex question, but one that's fairly easy to answer because we all know the answer. I think by now Trinidad and Tobago knows the response to that, that we are not in a position to maintain business as usual. And, and I'm using business as usual um, simply because a lot of people understand what that means. What has happened now with the state of emergency is that it has added an additional layer um, to, to our circumstances. And from a social and economic perspective, I think COVID-19 is really the eye of the storm that we're facing in Trinidad and Tobago and all of these additional layers. So the, the state of emergency now calls for additional disruptions, additional adjustments to be made to the national community in terms of how we work, in terms of how we exist in terms of how we transact our businesses. So we would have seen banks, for example, sending out notices indicating that they were changing their, their modus operandi, how they were going to engage with, with, with customers um, and only dealing with certain kinds of transactions and, enc and encouraging people to use online platforms, et cetera, to conduct their business. So we already have that sense with supermarkets, uh, have adjusted their hours, the, the regular markets where you can buy fresh produce, etc. They've adjusted their hours, etc. So it is an additional layer for us in Trinidad and Tobago that the state of emergency has brought. We know that there will be some additional um, disturbances in terms of unemployment. People, more people probably become unemployed, displaced, having to work rotations, having to work staggered hours, and all of these things are going to have impacts. And of course, from the human side, and I've been following the program since it, since it started this morning, the president of the Nurses Association made, made it very clear. I mean, it was his, his, his contribution this morning, I think, was so relevant. I mean, while he was speaking about his colleagues in the nursing fraternity and the medical fraternity, it is something that is going to impact all of us in Trinidad and Tobago in different ways as a result of the state of emergency, as a result of this storm that we're dealing with. COVID, as I said, I can be seen as tantamount to the eye of the storm that we're facing, the mental health issues. So the fact that people are no longer able to go outside and exercise, you really, and, and you and, and Carrie and, and, and they all were chatting about it earlier, that you're seeing less traffic, but people are, in fact, moving about. You know, we're still not re as restricted as one would like to think. Uh, so people are still moving about, but there and is going to be Dr. some mental Ant, health. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, I'm just sitting and looking at, you know, even though we're in a state of emergency, we do have a system in place for these exemptions. And we've seen over 300,000 people apply for exemptions mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that there's really a difference between the amount of people who are moving now in this SOE or even before the SOE? Well, I don't have the numbers, but my kind of windscreen survey, for want of a better word, suggests that people are still moving about. Um, if I had, you know, a say in the matter, I think we would see fewer persons because what we're trying to do is not limit persons' freedoms. And I think people uh, are not quite understanding that COVID-19 and the measures that are being put in place are for a very specific purpose. You want yeah. to limit movement. You want to limit the opportunities for spread, which is why we would want persons to stay at home. And the Prime Minister made it very clear, um, and there have been several memes about it um, after Saturday. You know, what it is you have to get in the grocery, so. You know, what it is you have to go out the road to get, so. You know, we, I, I heard the Commissioner of Police and... 
I really marvel at, at our mentality in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and quite frankly, I think persons who are applying for some of these curfew passes really see it as a status symbol. I have a pass, so therefore I can put it on my windscreen and, um, you know, and essentially um, play myself because I'm an important person. I don't think that we understand essential means that without your service, something is going to collapse. That is what essential means, separate and apart from our security services, which according to, if I remember my industrial relations um, courses from many, many decades ago, essential, you know, our security services are, are categorized as essential because they are required to maintain law and order. They're required to provide certain right. services. Outside of that, essential, there are tiers of essential. So the fact that you might be the CEO of a company doesn't necessarily mean that you're essential. Um, so I listened to the commissioner of police, and I think he's absolutely correct in terms of not granting these curfew passes simply because people think that they want to be on the road or they want to, to prove that they are, in fact, important um, by getting a curfew pass. So I would want to encourage my fellow Trinbegonians to join the exaltation, the, the exaltation from, from the Ministry of Health. Really stay at home if you don't need to be out because that is the only way that we're going to flatten the curve because every opportunity, every time that you go out is an opportunity for there to be interaction and for there to be some some exposure, um, and yeah. also remember the whole concept of the bubbles. So if you live in a household where, you know, you have two or more persons, every time you go out, you create an opportunity for there to be um, contamination because you don't know the persons with whom you're interacting, and you also don't know the persons with whom you've interacted, with whom they're interacting, and that's how the bubble and the spread, et cetera. So yeah. I really would, you been, know, I, sorry? We have been seeing it because we're seeing now, uh, as, as the... the we hear from the press conferences. Now you know the people who are dying, and we're seeing more than one, as much as three people dying from one family. Yeah, you know, because yes, we are contaminating the bubble, so to speak, yeah, because is, we're is going out and coming in, and it we're is extremely of tragic the fact where we, we are. Um, yeah? Not to be melodramatic, but I think. As Trinbegonians and adopted Trinbegonians, as you are, Natalie, because we know that you're one of us, um, yeah. I think we, we, we really need to take individual and collective responsibility to try to flatten the curve. This is not a job for any, any particular individual or set of individuals. So this is not the government's job or the Ministry of Health's job. It is really, a, it is really an opportunity for all of us as Trinbegonians to, to do our part to flatten the curve, to get rid of this scourge, because the more we complain about it and, and essentially try to live our lives the way we've, we've grown accustomed to living, living our lives, the longer the problem stays with us. So it is really incumbent on all of us to do what is right um, to, to flatten the curve and to, to essentially treat us with this issue that we're facing, this crisis that we're facing. Okay. And do you think that we're seeing, you know, a lack of understanding from the population about the micro and macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 on us, even though the government is saying to us, even when it, when it comes on to the social impact, that it can only help for the month of May and it can only help so much people because the government has literally been borrowing money yeah. so that it can provide, you know, some kind of relief for those who are, who are really displaced by the pandemic. Natalie, I think there is a greater level of public education that is required. Um, you know, I, I have conversations with persons who say that, you know, had the government done X, Y, and Z um, months ago, this would not have happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't walk in the government's shoes. Um, I stand on the outside. I have a certain level of knowledge, a certain level of information, which I try to draw on to share information and to engage in public education. But that said, I, I understand the government is challenged because that is part of, you know, my professional craft, and I understand that we're challenged, and it's, it's really very straightforward. If we have a primary source of revenue and that there is sluggishness in that particular sector, both in terms of the energy sector and the non-energy sector, there is sluggishness, and we have, in fact, been experiencing deficits in those sectors, meaning that we are not earning, but we are still spending. Um, it means that this, there is a challenge. There is a very real economic challenge that the government is facing. The Minister of Finance yeah. last week when he, when he, you know, shared, he had the media conference looking at the social protection measures, he spoke of some of the measures that were put in place last year. 
And essentially, you know, the cost that was to the government, $5 billion. He also, um, and I'd like to say it's a quotable moment, he, he also indicated that, you know, his debt to GDP ratios were out of whack, meaning that we are spending and borrowing more money than we are, in fact, earning, so that we're in a very precarious position. The population needs to understand that. Now, having said that, I also recognize that the population at different tiers. So we have those persons who are at or near poverty levels who really are vulnerable and who will require assistance. We have our pensioners, and I heard that segment a little while ago on your program. So they are on fixed incomes. They need to have money so that they can buy their medication. They can do whatever else needs to be done. So they need those transfers. Then you have those who are the working population who are your everyday monthly paid workers, but who now, because of their circumstances, they have children to look after at home, whether it's one child, two two children, as the case might be, but they also have to put infrastructure in place to deal with those for those children to participate in their educational activities. So they have to buy computers, a new school term. I mean, we seem to be operating in the twilight zone, but a new school term is going to start in a couple of months' time. And while you no longer have to buy uniforms, per se, and book bag and all of those things, you have to ensure that your children have the hardware, the, the, the software to do the work that is required for them to participate meaningfully in the education system. You have to ensure that there is the Internet. So there are different tiers. So people have different responsibilities and different demands in terms of, of income demand, so to speak. But the government can only do so much, and what the government has clearly signaled is that they're going to help the people, um, those persons who are vulnerable, who are the lower end of the rung. They're going to, in- to ensure that they're pensioners. And the government has, in fact, continued to pay its public sector workers. Now, whether that is sustainable or not, I don't think that is sustainable, but the Minister of Finance also last week indicated that we have, in fact, been engaging in some borrowing. He spoke about a World Bank loan, but he also spoke about um, a loan from the government of China to the tune of 200-plus million U.S. dollars. So the government has, in fact, been incurring a lot of debt, which which is another conversation. Yeah. But, you know, with all the debt that the government is incurring, do you believe that, you know, it should consider its, reconsider its position on going to the IMF? Because with a debt to GDP ratio that, you know, you say it's out of whack, and with all this borrowing, the, the Minister of Finance did point out that he's borrowing at very, you know, good rates, 4.5% over X amount of years, and that they still have good credit rating out there. Should it consider going to the IMF? All right, let me, let me put my spin on the IMF conversation. Um, the International Monetary Fund um, is, of course, a multilateral agency that we in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, back in the 80s, we had a very unfortunate relationship. And I say unfortunate because we were all experiencing high balance of payments deficits, and we resorted, Trinantabigo, let me talk about Trinantabigo's case, we resorted to going to the IMF to engage in a structural adjustment program. Of course, that structural adjustment program focuses on fiscal consolidation, meaning that what the IMF is going to ask you to do is to bring your expenditures down in line to your revenue streams so that you essentially reduce your overspend, reduce that, that, that budget deficit, that deficit gap that, we've been, that we were experiencing then. We are in the same situation now. But what happened in the 1980s, and there is a fairly famous video um, based on Jamaica's experience with the Structural Adjustment Program, Life After Death. It was around 2000 or thereabout that it was a docu- documentary that was done on Jamaica looking at the social implications of that structural adjustment program from the 1980s. Fast forward to where we are in 2021, 30, almost 40 years later. And I think that social impact, negative social impact primarily because there were high levels of unemployment, and the structural adjustment program, of course, in those days came with certain conditionalities from the IMF. So you had to cut your expenditure, which means that you had to cut some, some you had to cut employment in certain areas, et cetera, et cetera. So there is that residual historical impact that many Caribbean countries have in terms of that IMF program, the structural adjustment program 
from the 1980s. As I said, fast forward to 2021, and the IMF, certainly over the last decade, has essentially tried to, to present a different picture in terms of how it supports countries that are in balance of payments, deficits that are experiencing the kinds of of deficits such as what we're, we're experiencing in Trinidad and Tobago. So while this, their focus is still on fiscal reform, getting your budgets to balance, bringing down your expenditures, the IMF has been very careful to see that their focus also is on ensuring that vulnerable persons in your society, and certainly via social protection programs, that persons are not put into deeper levels of poverty and that you pay attention to persons who are vulnerable. So that is their stated position. Another thing I want to say about the IMF is that they have, in fact, they, they engage in what we call Article 4 consultations, meaning that for all of their member countries on an annual basis, um, or hopefully on an annual basis, they will send a team down from the IMF, a team of economists, they will come and they will have a chat with your government officials, bilateral discussions. I mean, not put it as loosely as a chat, but it's really a bilateral chat that they're having. Between the they IMF were here and in TNT, was it last year or the year before? No, actually, our last Article 4 consultation was in 2018. 2018, wow. Yeah. So we've, not, so we've not had an Article 4 consultation in Trinidad and Tobago. And again, to my mind, these conversations are really a way of, of auditing or monitoring, helping you understand what you might be able to do differently as a country to, uh, to make the adjustments that are required. Um, so, so to not have an Article 4 consultation means that we really have not had the benefit of external oversight. All companies and their, all businesses have audits, and you sometimes have external auditors because they come in and they tell you, well, you know, you need to improve on X, Y, and Z because this is a risk, that is a risk. And, this, you know, you can do this better. You, you can probably rethink how you've done this, X, Y, and Z. Right. So I think but that Dr. there is a, mm -hmm. The question is, should the government of Trinidad and Tobago go to the IMF to restructure, to, to balance the books, as you say, so that we can find ourselves in a better position, hopefully in the long run? I think, or stay uh -huh. away from it, understanding fully well that even though the IMF may have adjusted how it treats with economies and its member states, is that there are a lot of vulnerable people, a lot of unemployed people, a lot of people in vulnerable society, and with further adjustments is that we may end up with more people in those categories. I think, Natalie, that we have an opportunity here. They say in a crisis there are also opportunities. I think we have an opportunity to engage in a conversation with the IMF or with the other multilaterals as to how we can make adjustments to ensure that we try and reduce our debt situation and to reduce the deficits that we're experiencing and to engage in some forms of fiscal consolidation. It is a conversation, and I think we should not lose the opportunity to engage in that conversation. Yes, we have vulnerable persons, but that can be part of the conversation. So if I'm having a conversation, it is very easy for me to say that I would prefer or I would not wish to have persons who are already in a vulnerable um, situation um, further compromise because of any adjustments that I have to make. That, is, that can be very well part of the conversation and the negotiation. So I know, but we've seen mm -hmm. even with Barbados where they had to cut the public service by thousands. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to have the conversation, but the reality to me suggests that regardless of what the conversations are, there are people who are going to be suffering hardships as a result of the adjustments that have to be made. And if there are corrective measures that are required, taking loans that don't come with conditionalities that allow you to change, to, to address the source of the problem, I don't think that is a helpful way forward. So taking loans um, from whichever source that do, not, uh, that do not address the core problem that you're facing. So the core problem that we're facing is that we're spending more that we, than we are earning. If we continue to borrow, to engage in consumer spending or to fuel consumer spending without addressing what, is the structural, what are the structural issues that need to be addressed, I think that is simply kicking the can down the road and trying to avoid um, facing the reality so that in 10, 15, 20 years' time we're going to have or even before that, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where our debt is going to be so unsustainable that we will not be able to enjoy 
the benefits of, of a good credit rating or of accessing funds on the domestic or the global market. So, so it is a and catch still, 22. And it might not... still drive us right there. Pardon? All right, Dr. Atz, I hope you're hearing me, but um, uh, we do have to wrap. Dr. Atz, can you Yes, hi. Hi, yes, I'm here still, Natalie. Right, but we do have to wrap, Dr. Atz. Uh, Dr. Atz, sorry. So uh, thank you so much. Let us hope that the Minister of Finance will take into consideration, your, into consideration your suggestion. I think it's valid. I think it has merit to it. But let's see what happens. Thanks a lot, Natalie. Have a good day. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlene Axe there. And she's saying that, you know, you can borrow, but if you borrow and there isn't, you're not fixing the issues, then you might still end up with problems down the road where you can't borrow your credit rate because your credit rating is so bad. So she thinks that the government should consider having the conversation with the IMF. We take a break and we'll be back with you.